you know what what does it look like what does a civilization look like what do a, what does it what does a set of policies look like that allow us to move away from from the kind of risks that we're experiencing right now but i don't think it's possible to really uh, do that properly without applying a systems lens a systems lens which of course is why i'm really grateful to to be doing this with schumacher who've been in this space for, for many years. So without further ado, let me share my screen and we can get started. So the title of my report is Deforestation and the risk of collapse. And I think the, the argument that I'm making is that the pandemic, when we look at it from the perspective of planetary boundaries and that whole very, very uh, illuminating scientific discourse that's emerged over the last decade, I mean, really since 2009, I think the first main paper came out, of, uh, which kind of really put forward that in a systematic way. When we take that in, into context, I think a really strong case can be made that one of the most useful ways of understanding this pandemic is that it really is a tipping point and that we've actually most likely crossed a threshold and we're now moving into a new phase. And as you know, I've, I've made this argument before. Some of you have heard me speak about this before. I've made this argument that we, we are moving through some kind of a phase shift. But what I'm gonna do is kind of really try and focus in a bit more on how I think we specifically got to this point, looking at some of the research that my report covers. So let's begin with um, the first section of my report kind of really just tries to go in to the issue of industrial civilization. And I think one of the biggest takeaways that I took from you know, looking at a lot of this scientific literature was that it's not possible anymore to separate out the pandemic from industrial civilization itself. And it's kind of interesting because when you see the way in which we're talking about the pandemic right now, it's still very narrow. You know, COVID-19, public health crisis, you know, we talk about the pandemic in terms of disease and, and impact on different systems in our society, but we don't really look at its civilizational context. And what's interesting is that most of the warnings that came about the risk of a pandemic did so on the basis of recognizing that it was industrial civilization itself that was increasing the risk of a pandemic. And I think one of the most recent warnings came in 2016, and I think there were many others as well. But that was the one that I remember quite well. I, have, I wrote about it. Um, it was a report by published by the National Academy of Medicine. Um, they had this commission on global health and they warned that there would be a pandemic this century and it would be inevitable. And they also said there'd be a 20% chance of four overall pandemics this century. And the reason that they put forward this scenario was quite interesting is they pointed at processes which we take for granted as part of industrial expansion, population growth, increasing food production, urbanization, uh, and you know, globalization, the increased connection of transport and communication, all the rest of it, and especially transport links, of course. And this, they said, was increasing uh, the chances of animal and human, act, human interaction. So there's been a number of other studies since then, and, and my report mm -hmm. goes through a number of them, but the two that particularly struck my mind were one in 2018, um, where um, the, this a paper noted that disease vectors were increasing as a result of industrial activities. And uh, specifically another one earlier this year warned of zoonotic diseases being spread uh, due to climate change and land use changes driven by industrial expansion. And obviously zoonotic diseases are uh, diseases from animals. But what was quite 
interesting about that study is that it was published in January uh, this year. So, you know, it came out at a time when the pandemic was actually kicking off, but we hadn't quite realized it yet. And uh, Professor Carlson actually commented and tell about this, that even if we keep global temperatures below the, the, that kind of safe limit of two degrees Celsius, which you know, probably the safe limit is a little bit lower than that, but even if we stay below two degrees Celsius, we're already at a point where the, the land use changes and the kind of the encroachment on wildlife and the migration of species as a result of climate change so far is going to make this happen. And he, he actually said this quite, quite clearly that, you know, we're, we're bound to get more disease outbreaks now. So that's the situation that, that we're in right now. When we look at this in the context of the planetary boundaries discourse, we begin to get a bit more of a framework to think about this. In 2009, I think, was, as I mentioned, was the first big paper, but it was only five years ago um, that they did, there was an update of that work um, by you know, Will Stefan and, and the rest of you know, the, the, the scientific team working on this. And they identified these four specific planetary boundaries um, one of which, of course, is, is land, land use change or land system change, which they said there's already um, a high risk that we've crossed or are crossing a threshold. Now, the issue that's important here is, of course, we don't really know for sure when we've crossed a boundary because it's impossible to tell. What we do know is that we can begin to have a heightened sense of risk, and that's where the, the red is highlighted there where, where the countries where those boundaries appear to be most likely to, uh, to be, have a high risk of, of, of being crossed. But of course, we could have crossed those boundaries even earlier, or we may be about to cross them in, in some time, but what we, we, we can't really pin it down. And perhaps we'd only really know some time after the fact when we've accumulated more data. And what's important to understand about this idea of planetary boundaries, its relationship to the safe operating space. And I think many of us are probably very familiar with this, but what's critical to, to, to remind ourselves is that when we breach planetary boundaries, what the scientists are warning us is that you're shrinking that safe operating space, which they say has existed for, you know, over ten, you know, tens of thousands of years. We've had this kind of stability within these boundaries. As we begin breaching them, that operating space for human survival shrinks. So the risk that we're seeing is that if we're crossing these boundaries and if the pandemic is a symptom of crossing those boundaries, then we're shrinking that space for human survival. And the question of course is, can we begin to see evidence that that is exactly what we're doing? In a way, what I tried to do with this report was to take a look to see to what extent is there evidence when we're looking at the impact of the pandemic and also the impact of these other crises that we are already in that process of shrinking the operate safe operating space. Now, one of the kind of gaps in planetary boundaries discourse that I think needs to be filled is the role of energy. The, the discourse understandably focuses very much on our interactions with the biosphere. But as a result, that focus has left out the role of the energy system in interfering in the biosphere. Now, it could be that the, the, there's, there's, there's perfectly understandable uh, reasons why it shouldn't be included as a separate planetary boundary, and perhaps that's why it's not been uh, conceptualized as such. But it's very important to take it into account because of the fundamental role that energy plays in our civilization and in, in our consumption process, in our ability to basically run everything that we do in our societies. These slides that I'm going to show, uh, many of you who've heard me speak before may have may recognize some of these slides. I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. But as you can see, I'm going to refer to that concept that I always bring up, EROI or energy return on investment. Now this is a, this is a concept that I do think people working in the planetary boundaries discourse need to um, really kind of bring in much more closely into their analysis because it gives us a sense of, of how to track these kind of tipping points. And in, in the case of energy, 
we can see that there has been some kind of a tipping point uh, which we've passed some time ago. From this study that was done by uh, two French economists a couple of years ago, uh, published in um, a, a very prestigious journal, I don't remember the name, I think it was Ecological Economics, but I might be wrong. Uh, the lead author was Victor Court. Um, and they basically did the, one of the first, I mean, there's been several, but this was, I think, one of the first most comprehensive global studies of, of the energy return investment of, of fossil fuels. And what they found was that around uh, the middle of the 20th century, you know, 1960s onwards, uh, global EROI seemed to peak. Uh, now, just as a reminder, energy, energy return on investment is a simple measure of the amount of energy that is used to get a certain amount of energy out of any particular resource. So it's a really powerful efficiency measure. And what it tracks in that way is if you're getting to a point where you're using more and more energy to get a certain amount of energy out, then obviously what's actually happening is it's costing you more for, for some reason. And usually that's to do with all sorts of issues. There's, there's, there's below ground issues and there's above ground issues. There's issues around geology um, and there's issues around societal and economic costs. And when those things can come together, it means that the overall costs of trying to get this energy out are going up. And that's clearly what's happened. And of course, one of the things we are aware of is that around 2005, global oil, oil production went through this inflection point where conventional crude oil plateaued. And since then to meet demand, we've switched to unconventional oil and gas, which is much more expensive to get out, a little bit more complicated um, and certainly dirtier for the environment and more polluting. So all those costs are there. Um, so that, that cost of energy is going up and that has an impact on our economy. What we found uh, with this, correlating with this, is that there's been a decline in the rate of GDP growth, very much around the same period, 1960s onwards. Um, and it's been tracked very specifically with uh, the most industrialized uh, kind of areas, the US, Europe and Japan have all experienced a decline in the rate of GDP growth, coinciding with this period of, of net energy decline. And of course, we know that since 2008, 2009, the, the financial crash, that overall economic growth has been on a kind of a plateau. It's not really experienced a, a recovery that's ever seen a return to the pre-2008 period um, in any way. And we also know that all of this is continuing to be correlated over these long periods of time. There's, there's, this growth in oil, this growth in energy, this growth in GDP. And we also know that in order to keep the show going, one of the things that we've done, especially since 1960, we've increased the, our dependence on debt and we've used ingenious credit instruments to keep uh, the, the growth machine going. And so many um, critical economists have argued that the growth has kept going and it's kind of a phantom growth because it's the, there's increasing divergence between the real world economy and this economy of financialization. And ironically, since the 2008 financial crash, that, that bubble of debt, which has kept things growing, has, has, has actually gone even bigger um, and much, much bigger through the pandemic as well. So that takes us up to that. And what I wanted to do then, um, one of the things that I discuss in the report is, is you know bringing some of this some of this data together and I make this argument that the pandemic can be seen as a continuum part of a continuum of of kind of these punctuated crises that ultimately have their roots in the interaction between the human system and the earth system and it's interesting when we look back so I just wanted to run through things to kind of put this in perspective so you know we had the 2000.com bust. Um, we then had the 2005 peak of conventional oil production. In 2008, you know, we had that confluence of events, as we all remember, with you know oil prices, um, the debt bubble in the housing markets, all of this, and there lots of different things coming together. And there's there's a, I think a very compelling literature which has argued that 
yes, there was a real, very real debt bubble in the housing markets. So there were all sorts of triggers. But one of the big triggers that's not really acknowledged very much in conventional discourse was the oil price hikes, which were indelibly linked to that peak of conventional oil produ production, or at least the plateau of conventional oil production between 2005 and about 2000 and, and 2005, 2008, which has, you know, it's kind of fluctuated a bit since then, but it's pretty much stayed flat. And of course, in that context, we had the Occupy uprisings against the, the banks and, and lots of um, anger of what was going on. And that seemed to also kind of spread around 2011. We had the Arab Spring uprisings. And again, there was this interesting context and lots of studies have shown that not only did we have the, the impact of global climate events, you know, you know big food basket uh, crises um, in all, all the major kind of regions. I remember, you know, we had like, you know, wheat scarcity and in you know, all sorts of things going on in, you know, India, Brazil, United States, you name, I think almost every food basket region experienced these, these problems. Um, and it contributed to food, food price hikes, among other things as well, um, which some uh, analysts say was, was a big trigger in the Arab Spring uprisings. We continue onwards, of course, in that period from 2008, you know, we had this massive quantitative easing. Um, and there was a big study out recently, which I reported on um, from the uh, uh, Ge Geological Society of Finland, um, which is, you know, a government agency arguing that actually it was that 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 uh, QE, that massive QE response, which um, helped to prop up the oil industry in terms of borrowing, but also helped to keep the oil price down um, and kind of continued to keep the show on the road. But at the same time, things continued to brew. And by 2018, we had a, a resurgence of the Arab Spring uprisings. Um, and we also had, by the end of 2019, the, the, you know, the food price index again started to go up and uh, some analysts again noted a correlation with um, continuing inequalities and political repression in that part of the world, as well as the food prices and, and, and the uprisings, of course. And of course, then we had, you know, we move on to, to this year and we had out of the blue this, this, this pandemic. Now, following the pandemic, we look and we can see it's almost holding up a mirror to what has just happened in the last decade. It's triggered an economic collapse. It's triggered an oil price collapse. It's triggered an oil production collapse. We've had the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States and around the world, uh, in, in, specifically in Western countries. And we've also had um, a resurgence of the right. And we've had in, in terms of our like anti-lockdown protests and things like that, but also I think those anti-lockdown protests are significantly motivated by a sense of, of genuine discontent and, and lack of um, trust in what the authorities are doing. So we can see in a sense that 2020 has been an inflection point and the pandemic has acted as an amplifier for all the trends and processes that we've seen converging and accelerating. And now this year, they've been happening at the same time. And of course, over the last decade or two decades, these have been happening to some extent around the same time, but we're really seeing an acceleration, I think, this year. And that's uh, what I've used to kind of applied my theoretical systems lens to kind of try to make sense of what's happening. Um, and so I'm going to run through some examples here. I'm not going to go into in detail, but what we're seeing really is that we're, we're, we're now navigating multiple tipping points you know for, so we've got you know we have as an example we have in climate change the albedo effect in the arctic but really that's just one out of many 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 other tipping points what's interesting is that the studies that have come out around the tipping point literature again the planetary boundaries literature have again argued that this risk of crossing tipping points is something that is essentially unquantifiable and the current level of CO2 emissions that exist in the atmosphere are sufficient at this point to put us in this state of unknowability, as in it's quite possible that we may already, you know, I think the researchers at Potsdam really made this argument forcefully with their hot house earth kind of theory, is that it's possible that we may already be crossing 
tipping points and some of them even maybe irreversible that could trigger abrupt processes of, of climate change that then go out of control. We don't actually know whether or not that's happening or not. We can hope that it's not happening. We know that we're certainly skimming the edges, but we're getting really, really close. And we don't want to be in a point where we look back and we say, oh my God, we missed, we missed the opportunity to, to avoid that. But we're seeing those, this, this kind of tipping point scenario happening in many, many other areas. So for example, Tim Jackson uh, from the University of Surrey did a really interesting study earlier this year where he looked at the acceleration of and the intensification of, of, of economic recessions. And as you can see from the graph, there's really quite a, quite a very clear, it seems, discrepancy between the way recessions are getting kind of bigger and stronger and slower um, in the last few decades and how they were uh, uh, in the kind of the early half of, of the 20th century. Something seems, again, seems to have tipped. And there's an argument as going back to the EROI point that not just globally, but nationally, EROI in different countries may have, may have peaked. And there was a study a couple of years ago from Leeds University, which argued that actually EROI in, in the UK may have peaked in, in the year 2000 and could be going down, um, which of course is a problem because some economists estimate that the EROI level that you need for to sustain economic growth is around 11. So what I'm concerned about is that we're having multiple tipping points happening at the same time. And when, when that happens, you can have what, what, what some people might describe as a whole system phase transition. So multiple tipping points that happen at the same time and your whole system begins to shift. So there's a risk that the system itself, the global system is experiencing a tipping point. And there's an argument to be made, I think, that the pandemic is exactly that tipping point. Now, what I want to do is go back to the one of the central themes of, of the paper, which is deforestation. Hopefully, I've only got um, not too many slides left on this, so I may go over my allocated half hour a little, but hopefully um, um, I'll be able to cover it without um, taking too much more time. So deforestation, we know, was not a specific driver or trigger of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that was triggered by what seems to be expanding industrial activities and specifically in relation to these consumption practices in China, where we have a very rapidly expanding urban society, which is encroaching onto wildlife with these very specific types of consumption habits, encroaching into all sorts of exotic animal species and so on and so forth. But still, what we're seeing is deforestation is an end point of the same industrial activities that drove that. Now, what the worry is, of course, is that while deforestation may not have been the trigger for COVID-19, and now that COVID-19 has happened, the acceleration of deforestation may well trigger future pandemics down the line. And at the same time, it may also drive other um, crises. And one of the biggest ones, of course, is climate change. Deforestation accounts for something like 15% of global carbon emissions. And over the last two decades or so, the evidence has emerged that tropical forests are no longer acting as carbon sinks, which means they're now giving out more carbon than they do absorb. Um, the other problem is that there's studies which show that locally within these tropical forests, it's quite possible that that kind of impact of, of climate change could actually be much worse than the conventional scenarios. And that itself could drive these um, forest ecosystems into a tipping point. And one of the most alarming tipping points that was covered in a study just in September was looking at how COVID-19 is accelerating uh, deforestation in an indirect way because of the impact of lockdowns in countries like Brazil um, and other kind of uh, other countries we've had an acceleration of deforestation during the COVID-19 containment policies um, and even in some places where there haven't been good containment policies but also to do with lots of economic pressures and stuff around around the same time so the other concern is if we're going to have a pandemic which triggers 
and allows more tropical deforestation, there's a further danger that that's going to increase the risk of zoonotic disease outbreaks. And that could lead to a further amplifying feedback. But then, of course, there's a slightly bigger picture scenario here, which is that if we're looking at the situation as it stands, you know, the Earth once had some 60 million square kilometers of forest, and that's now gone down to 40. If we continue losing forests at this rate, they could disappear in the next 100 to 200 years. There was a study that was published earlier this year in, in Nature Scientific Reports, which I did a, a story on, which um, did some modeling around this. And they came to this very shocking conclusion that 90% probability that uh, industrial civilization could collapse within the next two to four decades just due to the impact of deforestation. And they argued that this was because of the role of forests, the critical role of forests in these life support systems, such as carbon storage, oxygen production, soil conservation, water cycle regulation, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very serious situation that we're looking at. And it's absolutely critical for us to do something about deforestation and to recognize its wider drivers. So what is hey, uh, Navis about 10 minutes for you to get on to your more your solution section. <laughs> OK, fantastic. Right. Okay. Cool. So what's driving deforestation? So what we know is um, and this graph was uh, put together by um, uh, a team published in Global Environment Change, I think, you know, two years ago. And, uh, you know, they were looking at the uh, carbon emissions from deforestation and um, Number of number of things that they found are really important. I mean, first of all, what we've seen is that global agriculture is responsible for some 80% of global deforestation. And we look at this list, what's very clear is that it's not just one commodity, it's all the commodities. Everything that we're producing ultimately is linked in some way to deforestation and, and associated carbon emissions. So we, we really do have quite a challenge on our hands. Um, within Europe, a third of globally traded ag agricultural products are linked to deforestation. Um, and even within Europe, you know, which has, you know, a kind of policy to try and do something about this deforestation inside Europe is accelerating. And it's increased by around 49% in recent years. Now, this is important to understand because there is a kind of a mismatch in policy. And I think there's a political kind of and an economic motivation for this, because one of the biggest, well, the biggest global driver of carbon emissions from deforestation is actually beef production. And especially in Brazil, but also including Latin America and Africa, and it accounts for some 34% of emissions. The next major driver is from oil seeds uh, and vegetable oils more generally at around 20%. Now palm oil, which understandably and rightly is, is has a lot of focus, but I think to some extent has a disproportionate focus. It accounts for about 14% of deforestation, which is much, much less than beef production. And it's, uh, you know, I'm glad to see that many environmental NGOs are now taking this up. But for many years, there's been a, a focus on palm oil at the expense of other things. And as a result, it's allowed the EU system to do something quite contradictory, which is to kind of do a boycott on palm oil while pursuing a trade deal with Brazil and continuing to, to accelerate imports of beef from South America, which is completely contradictory and makes no sense uh, if your intention is really to, to do something about deforestation. Now, the, in terms of this mismatch, the question then is, what do we do about this situation? And now, glad to hear, I'm gonna start coming more towards solutions. So I've identified a whole range of issues there. In order to get out of this, I think we need to fundamentally um, shift the way that we're thinking about these things. And part of me wanting to do this report was to kind of spur that conversation onwards, which is to say, we need to stop thinking about the pandemic as if it's just a pandemic. The pandemic is far more than just a, 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 you know, a pandemic. And it's more than just a health crisis. It's a civilizational crisis. And it's a signal of a civilization that is now degrading the conditions of its own existence. And that's forcing us to realize that we really do need a fundamental economic paradigm shift if we're going to sustain civilization. Because one of the things that we're now seeing with the pandemic is that whichever way you go, 
whether you you know let it rip so to speak you know the virus or whether we um, you know have these lockdowns or whether we have periodic lockdowns and even if we're we do a lot better as they're doing in east asia with with their pandemic response you know even over there where they've minimized the the, the you know the, the threat to lives and livelihoods they're still facing you know massive global recession so it seems that all the evidence is saying to us that we really have moved into this new phase where the economy is going to contract as a consequence of the pandemic even if we have a vaccine and i hope you know the vaccine does come and 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 you know works and is able to be rolled out fairly quickly but i think most health experts are saying that it's you know the virus is still going to be here we're still going to have to deal with it we're still going to have to rearrange and restructure how we do things in our societies while we're having the vaccine and even when we do have it so we're, we're moving into a point where there's not going to be a return to normal and that means really ditching this lesser fair market economics which says let the market run let the market sort it out clearly the market doesn't work the market has actually created this crisis that we're facing we need a much more intelligent approach which intentionally manages markets within planetary boundaries and orients them around public health and that needs to be really intentional that's something which needs to be really put out as we're not saying end markets but we're saying intelligently manage markets so they realize what their foundations are which ultimately is, is ecosystems so one of the first big recommendations of, of, of our report is how do we tackle deforestation towards a global pact i've some i've written a fair amount about palm oil and deforestation in the past and one of the things that, as i mentioned about um the eu approach is i think the current narrow approach hasn't worked and one of the big things i'm concerned about with the the EU's approach, which is the kind of the boycott approach. And I think their approach is quite specific. At the moment, they've started with the, you know, the um, a, a kind of de facto boycott on palm oil for biodiesel. Once again, I understand why they're doing this. The, the big concern is that there's so many studies out, and I've named a few of the sources there, um, Nature Sustainability, um, the International Union uh, of the Conservation of Nature, blah, blah, blah. They've basically shown that if you move away from palm oil, and especially without dealing with the ongoing demand for these oil seeds, what happens is you just switch that demand to other oil seeds like soy, like rapeseed, like sunflower. And the problem is that they're much less efficient than palm oil in terms of land use, in terms of energy and fertilizer use and water use. Um, so I have those quotes there, and those are actually from a paper published this year in Nature Sustainability, which basically put forward this argument that certainly in the short or medium term we really need to look at switching to sustainable production in palm oil because just boycotting it is likely to make things worse because if we have a much less efficient oil seed we're going to drive greater rates of deforestation elsewhere and that is going to be absolutely disastrous we cannot afford that outcome so what is working and it's interesting that the same paper refers to the idea of um, sustainability in the in a, a local level looking at national and local methods and what's interesting is that there's now evidence that's emerging that in southeast asia especially in malaysia there is evidence of a reduction in the rate of deforestation um here's some data from global forest watch which shows that over the last three to five years the rate of deforestation has decreased year on year and we're not out of the woods as you can see it's still it's still there but it's definitely gone down. And most experts are saying that one of the reasons it's gone down is because of the Malaysia Sustainable Palm Oil Certification Standard. That was introduced in 2015 and it became mandatory in 2018. And this is quite, quite a new thing to have a government actually saying that this is gonna be kind of a legally enforceable thing. And, and what's interesting is that they've, they've got a whole regime to monitor and enforce it. And there's penalties and fines if producers don't comply. What they've been struggling with is trying to get as much of the industry actually certified. Um, I think over two thirds of plantations are now certified as of a couple of months ago. It may have gone up since then. And even NGOs like Mighty Earth, who have, who have been doing a lot of work around monitoring deforestation and, and rightly critical of some of the problems that still exist in Southeast Asia, have noted that it, the, the progress has been so good um, in places like Malaysia, that actually 
that combination of, of, of techniques that are being used could be seen as a blueprint to stop deforestation in places like the Amazon. And that, blue, that, that blueprint involves a number of things. It involves satellite technology to track what's going on. You have ongoing reporting from NGOs and others who are you know, letting authorities in Malaysia know that this is what's happening when they find instances of violations. And then you have the rapid response, hopefully rapid response, from the authorities to, and from producers themselves to do something about that. And so far, it's, 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 been, it's been doing fairly well. It's just the beginning. There's a lot of progress to be made. And MSPO is also um, a standard which hasn't been researched very much. We'd certainly need more independent kind of analysis of, of how these certification standards are working. But the question then, of course, is if we're going to make something like that work, we can't just say, well, let's just let everybody just do what they want. We need some kind of approach to incentivize these things. What I'm suggesting that we do is we look at trade as an instrument to do this. Currently, free trade agreements are very much premised around self-interest. If we want, if we shift our mindset to realizing how self-interest is bound up with ecological restoration, we can then bring trade negotiations conditional to the idea of ecological rest restoration, to say that we, we will negotiate trade agreements, but we have to have underpinning that this goal of securing sustainable production and restoring ecosystems. And that will be a new fundamental priority that governments and international institutions like the EU and the UN and beyond can actually try to legislate for, to create that foundation. Once that's done, we can envision a scenario where the EU partners like Malaysia, uh, countries like Brazil, instead of having these kind of open playing field where it's like, let's just have these trade agreements and, and it's just the interest, self-vested interests at play, you have a different approach. Whereas unless countries begin meeting standards that are mutually recognized around sustainability and sustainable production, then those trade agreements just won't happen. And I think that's the key. Also what's key is that if it does happen is that there is a sense of the dividends that can come, which is the sharing of new ecological goods and services. Because if there's sustainable production going on in these third countries and there's sustainable production going on within the EU, you know, with the Green New Deal, for example, the prospect of creating these you know, corridors of trade where you can actually begin to share and accelerate that kind of approach and that, that these new technologies, then begin, allows us to kind of open our minds and see what really is possible here with that kind of an approach. In that sense, moving into the EU and into the West where we're talking about implementing the Green New Deal, let's move beyond just talking about the idea of funding lots and lots of renewable energy projects which is important and critical, but let's look more closely at how to really make that, uh, make that work in order to avoid the crisis that we're seeing. First of all, we need to mitigate the oil industry crises and we can bridge these things together by nationalizing and winding down our oil industry assets with, you know, with government support so that we can mitigate that impact of the oil industry crisis and move it directly into supporting a Green New Deal. So, you know, we can retrain and reskill workers in, in, those in those industries into the new clean technology infrastructure and, you know, create a massive public works program. At the same time, I think it's important, and this obviously is being discussed, the idea of a circular economy and so on and so forth. But let's be really clear and intentional about this, that what we really need is we need to fully electrify mining and manu manufacturing and ensure that that electrification is coming from carbon free energy sources. And we also need to make sure that that circular economy process is in itself supported by that carbon free technology infrastructure. Okay, and just a couple for, more minutes, Navid, okay? Okay, fantastic. We also need to invest very heavily in fossil free regenerative agriculture. And I think one of the ways we're gonna be able to do this is, is introducing really clear and specific targets for electrification and reduction of emissions and transition to renewables sector by sector. I think one of the things that's missing is that we have these very broad scale emission reductions targets, but we haven't broken that down into these very clear targets by the different sectors in these different areas. And that's really, really important so we can see how we're going to make that Green New Deal really impactful and really specific uh, 
in you know in mining in manufacturing in agriculture we have to stop talking about this in kind of broad brush terms of course something that will be familiar to all of you this idea of moving beyond gdp growth so i won't dwell on it too long but if endless growth is no longer possible and if the pandemic has truly revealed its limits there's no doubt that we have to relinquish gdp growth as a key indicator of, of true prosperity and in a sense the systemic crisis that we're facing is forcing us to, to, to begin to think out of the box. How do we continue to flourish in an economy which is contracting? And we can do this through shifting to all sorts of measures. And I think Kate Raworth and her donut economics approach is, is a massively valuable resource, which is already being um, taken up by many um, you know, local administrations. Um, so I won't dwell on it too long, but we know that these measures and these techniques do exist and can work. Finally, um, well, I think oh, there's two more slides. Um, in this slide, I think one of the things we need to do in terms of restructuring our views of the public and private sector is just retrieving this idea of the role of the state as, uh, as an entity that reconstitutes markets so they function in the public interest. Governments need to really proactively incentivize the private sector to focus on producing public goods and services within planetary boundaries and they can do that in so many different ways I mean one of the things is stop subsidizing fossil fuels shift those subsidies again to the right areas but also equity injections into key critical companies that that we think could be uh, powerful sectors that we need nationalization again of, of the biggest polluting industries and that can include not just the oil industry but also you know big agribusiness and other uh, industries even the petrochemicals industry and so on and so forth and also we need the government to lead on regulation to help unlock investment so that it's easier for um, startups and other companies and, and, and entrepreneurs in these sectors to access the funding that they need rather than jumping through hoops which are very much focused on the existing fossil fuel centered financing system. Finally, I'll close on this note about monetary reform. So obviously one of the big questions is how do we finance all of this? And, and the good news is we have um, you know, groups like Positive Money, who I know are um, very, very familiar to, to so many at Schumacher, who have given us a lot of good work on how we can finance this interest free without uh, quantitative easing. And I think uh, the recent um, work that Positive Money is doing around the, the, the Ways and Means facility at the Bank of England is really, really interesting and quite exciting, showing a very clear roadmap for how we can get that money, avoid debt, avoid um, inflation, and fund the green infrastructure. And you know, in that sense, we will avoid all the problems of QE um, to do with inequality and asset inflation, especially in the context of a deflationary uh, economy that we're experiencing right now. So with, all, with that, I um, would, would be delighted uh, if you're interested to learn more, to read the report and give me your feedback. This, uh, all of this ultimately is, work in progress. I've tried to do something that I hope triggers a conversation that moves us around, uh, kind of empowers us to have more and more of these kinds of conversations in, in the spaces that matter and that can kind of really push these kinds of ideas out there. Thanks so much. And I will now stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you very much, Naviz. That was really great. And there's a lot more of really good stuff in the paper, uh, folks, which you can find on, on the System Change Journal platform. OK, so we have a couple of uh, starting uh, questions, uh, which I, I'll ask people to uh, ask themselves. So first of all, we have Caroline New and then we have Hugh. Hi, hi Nafis and everybody. Um, I suppose it's it's great that you you've put forward some sort of structural roadmap, which shows or suggests that there is a possibility of um, dealing with with this. But politically, I mean, the big gap is how how on earth can we ever get the what forces, what movements, what strategy could produce the um, the shifts in government priorities and so on that you're talking about? You've got any ideas? Very important question. Um, I think, first of all, one important thing to do is to just make these ideas more and more mainstream. 
which is obviously obviously a struggle in itself but but the more mainstream the ideas are the more traction they can have and i think one of the dangers of course is that when we're seeing this now is that lots of interesting ideas like the green new deal net zero emissions have now become mainstream which is fantastic but of course there's the danger that with a government like boris johnson it just you know kind of goes down the toilet you know they you know they still still want to support fracking the, the the targets are too tepid there's all of that so i think we have to keep the momentum up on on the discourse and on the ideas and on that language and on those policies and just keep pushing them out there because the more the public is educated the more the public can hold government to account and really push that um, but it also shows us that with the fact that these things have become mainstream now i mean let's not forget that the european union one of the biggest markets in the world now has the green new deal as an official policy again there's lots to criticize there still but it gives us a platform to be taken seriously when we're talking about these ideas these are not fringe ideas anymore these are now ideas which are actively being discussed in policy the other good news i think is that despite the massive political struggles that we've got right now you know the deadlock between left and right the polarization you know just look at what's going on in trump land uh, at the moment with the u.s elections all very alarming but the fact that biden won the popular vote you know he could have done better would have hoped that he'd done better but the fact that he did again is is grounds for hope and it shows that there is a massive popular upswell that that wants change and i think the same will be the case here and with the weakness of trump i think we're seeing that weakness translated here as well with with johnson and in a way i think we're seeing the beginning of the end no matter what happens with the outcome of the us elections and so, you know it's not entirely been decided yet but you know i think either way we're seeing a sea change. Um, so there's, there's really an opportunity here, I think, to, to begin to say, how can we get um, the parties that are more sympathetic, you know, in, in, across the, the Atlantic, the Democrats, for here it's Labour, maybe other parties, the Green Party, Liberal Democrats. How do we get these parties to take up these ideas, to take them seriously, to make them part of their policy, policy prescription? So I think, we, I think a lot more engagement, a lot more education, um, and I think I think what we're seeing is that we can actually do this. And the Biden victory, ha, uh, to some extent, restored my sense of hope in politics um, that there is actually scope to engage within these admittedly broken democratic systems and to begin to to push levers and perhaps to get to a point where we can repair them. So I think we just have, we, let's keep pushing and we can we can do this. Thank you, um, Hugh. Hi, Navish. Thanks for that. Uh, can I just ask on the question of so-called sustainable palm oil that you referred to? I, I saw some research from a university in Indiana, hadn't heard of it before, called Purdue University, which said that from 2001 to 2016, Indonesia lost 38% of its trees to certified uh, palm oil production, which was 4% higher than non-certified sustainable uh, palm oil production. Has the certification scheme improved since 2016 or does this still reflect today the problems that sustainable palm oil is posing for deforestation? What do you think? So again, it's a really good question, very, very important question. There are real problems with the existing certification schemes. The other problem is, um, is that they're they're different. So there's different. So Indonesia has its own scheme, its own national scheme. Malaysia has its own national scheme. There's also the more um, widespread global scheme, the RSPO, Roundtable for Sustainable Palm, which is the more well-known kind of voluntary corporate backed scheme. So all the big companies like Nestle and Unilever are backing that scheme. Um, now, the problem we've got with, with these schemes is that on the one hand, with the voluntary scheme, I'm not sure which which scheme this particular study is about. I, I remember something from Purdue University, but I'm not sure if I've read this particular study. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I've noticed, for example, is that first of all, there is a real question as to how much these schemes are working. For me, I don't think it's an option for us to say sustainable palm oil is not possible. Because once we say it's not possible, then it means that we have to shift to another commodity and once we shift to another commodity, we will have all sorts of, sort of problems. 
those commodities aren't regulated at all, at all. I mean, there's no certification standards or regulations around sunflower or rapeseed, for example. Mm. Um, and studies suggest that there are similar issues with some of those oil seeds. Um, may not be as bad, although rapeseed, for example, there's a whole mix of studies which say they may be worse than palm oil in some ways and may not even meet the EU's own sustainability criteria. It's, and it's complicated and, and there's legitimate debate actually around those issues. So my, my, the way I'm seeing this is that I absolutely agree that there are, we need to be scrutinizing these standards. But what's happened at the moment is there's kind of been a backlash which says, okay, there's, this, this palm oil thing is not working. Sustainable palm oil, we've seen that there are real problems. I mean, especially with, with some voluntary standards like RSPO, there's been reports of violations and so on and so forth. So this sense of disillusionment in the sense, that, okay, we have to just stay away, which again is understandable as a consumer. You want to, you want to think, I don't want, I don't want to consume a product that is linked to, to, to deforestation and carbon emissions and all the rest of it. The problem is, of course, is that as we, if we did this as a society and systematically without a meaningful roadmap to sustainable production for you know, these other commodities overall, it's not going to work. It will make things much, much worse, given those inefficiencies that I mentioned. Mm. Um, and then that's a real issue. Palm oil, as an oil seed, is very efficient compared to, say, sunflower. So to get the same amount of oil seed that you would use you know, in chocolate or you know, your shampoo or whatever, you'd actually use more land if you switched all to over to another one. So my view is, so this is what I've been grappling with is how do we fix this? There has to be a way to say, you know, sustainable production. So I think one way to do this is, is, is to say, look, regulate all the commodities. Why single out one? Why, why, and, but, and, and why, and why, the, and, and don't just say, okay, let's do palm oil and beef, you know, which we, let's do all of them. Um, and why not? You know, we need to do this. And the only way to, to really make this consistent and make it work is to have a consistent standard. How to get to that point, you know, again, it's a bit of an uphill struggle, but I think mm. one of the ways to do that is to say, you know, I've, I've made this argument that we could potentially use trade to incentivize that. But where it is working, I think Malaysia is quite distinct from Indonesia. And I went out to Malaysia um, earlier this year, actually, before the pandemic. Um, and I had a bit of a chance to kind of speak to some of the people in the industry and speak to NGOs and other stuff like that. Um, and I think MSPO, there are still issues with MSPO as well. And there's issues around the integ you know, the way in which some, some people argue that the standards are not as strong as RSPO in terms of, you know, what the detail is around certain issues, around certain sustainability issues. But there are independent experts who've gone out there and had a look and they've said, well, actually, there's still, when you actually go and see some of the best of category cases, I mean, I think there was Robert He, uh, who is a Canadian conservationist, went out there and he said that these, it's really good, you know, it's really working uh, from what he can see. So I think there is a case of how do we make sure that things which are working on the ground are supported um, and, and, and kind of get that process that's working really kind of ramp it up. And how do we kind of disincentivize and ensure that where there are violations, where there are breaches, there can be a rapid way of saying, look, we need to put an end to that. And I think one way of doing that is this idea of having this network of, of, of kind of a, a trade agreements, which are founded on these ecological principles, which both sides will agree to. And when you have a goodwill in a, with a partner like a country, which is said, okay, look, we, I mean, at least Malaysia said we're committed to this. So then we can hold them to that commitment. And at the same time, the question is, well, what do they get? Well, if they do this and we can monitor it and it's all transparent, well, then they can get investment. Smallholder farmers can get support. They can get access to EU technology. And the EU also has an access to a sustainable source for certain commodities. And that to me is a win-win ideal scenario. It's how to get there. Absolutely, it's difficult. Um, and I, and I think you're right, we do need to have honest and open conversations about the challenges with mm. sustainable certification programs. We can't avoid those conversations, but I think there's no way forward other than sustainable production. Yeah. So, yeah it sounds a bit like you're saying that uh, we've got to get away from this idea that it's just a few bad apples in the barrel. It's the whole thing. And, and uh, you know, you can get sidetracked into, well, what's worse than that? And what's, you know, as you say, I think that's a very interesting holistic uh, approach, but um, okay. So next we've got uh, Julian. 
and then Richard Helen, Julian Caldicott, and followed by Richard Helen. Oh, sorry. Well, I, I didn't really want to have questions. I was just adding some little thoughts as we went along. However, you have prompted me to ask a bit of clarification on the sustainability issue. I mean, in oil palm, uh, you know, we're talking about there's two different sustainability issues in people's heads. One is no more deforestation and protecting orangutans and all the rest of the biodiversity and all the rest and the climate issue. Then there's the you know, forest that's already been converted to palm oil. It had to stabilize the frontier and then make that in that in, intensive margin of the converted land sustainable. Same word, different meaning. You know, and that's about soil fertility and protection of workers against you know, pesticide poisoning and things of that sort. It's, it's quite a different set of issues. So what are you what are you certifying? You know, in that sense, it, Malaysia, of course, has basically flattened all of its or all of its unprotected forests pretty much already. So it's it's in the business of stabilizing um, its frontiers. Indonesia is, is Indonesia is still sort of finishing off its forests, but. Uh, you know, that's sort of, that's the question really, those two things. What do you mean by sustainability in oil palm? Well, Malaysia is an interesting case. In Indonesia, things are pretty bad. Um, I think the government and their, their approach is slightly out of control. Although, even in Indonesia, um, Mighty Earth has documented that there's been a rate of decline in the, uh, a, de a decline in the rate of deforestation similar to what's gone on in Malaysia. And they think this is also because of the implementation of the cert certification standards. Um, and, and again, you know, coming from Mighty Earth, I think that's a significant, um, significant source of information, which means that something is really working there. But Indonesia seems to me a lot more, um, the situation there seems a bit more intractable in the government. So for example, the certification scheme is not mandatory. Um, it's not as robust, I think, for example, as Malaysia's scheme. Whereas uh, Malaysia has, for example, I mean, I think they've got something like just over 50% of, of their tropical forests are they're committed to maintaining their forest cover at just over 50%. Uh, so far, they've, they've, they've kept to that, although it has, you know, there has been encroachment. My understanding of the MSPO standard is that it aims to, to prevent further deforestation uh, going outside the existing boundaries that have already been done. Um, so that's basically within the existing boundaries of the plantations to, con to only grow within those boundaries, not to encroach further on forest. That's at least the ostensible uh, the, the goal. Also to, to make sure that the techniques that are used are sustainable in the sense that, for example, some of them have, are trying to use um, various renewable techniques on, on plantations, including recycling waste and stuff like that. Um, but I think there's a challenge there, you know, I think there's work to do. I mean, the people I've spoken to about the MSPO standard have said that, you know, it's, it's a great step forward for a local national uh, kind of standard. Um, but there are still some, there's still some issues around, you know, migrant, right, migrant worker rights. There's issues around, there's issues around some of those, some of those specific sustainability issues, for example, how, you know how what's you know when you what's the source of energy for um the way in which these you know what's you know what's the fertilizer inputs i think around those things there's some gaps and blind spots but that's where we need the standard to be strengthened not weakened and if we kind of give up on something that's beginning to work i think that's a huge mistake what we need to look at is how can we incentivize it because of course looking at if you look at it from the perspective of a country like malaysia um, you know, they've got hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers, as you know, as well as bigger companies and stuff. But, you know, there's a significant portion of the population who are just ordinary farmers who, who when they look at this and they and they see what the EU is saying, they just see it as, well, that's just a protectionist. You're just trying to shut us out, basically, for your own biofuels market. You don't care about us and you don't care about our development. and You don't care about the fact that we're a developing nation. So we need to kind of look at these different perspectives. And I think, again, I also sympathize with the EU's approach, which is just, look, let's just chop it, chop it out. You know, I see what they're trying to do. But again, it's like, I think we all need to pull back a little bit and come out of that perspective and say, OK, look, let's see it from your perspective. You see it from our perspective and let's work out a way what is actually going to work. Because right now, when they're at loggerheads, much weaker and, and there's, a, there's a risk that things won't work. 
Okay, th thank you very much. Um, so we've got Richard, Helen, and then Sally Lawson. Um, hi, Nappies. I'm wondering about uh, China as being one of the main resource hoovers of, of the world economy. Um, in particular, their relationship with Africa, which they seem to treat as their resource basket. How might these um, uh, planetary limits trade agreement type framing frameworks be attractive or made attractive for this the Chinese economy? Yeah, that's a, that's a problem one, really, isn't it? I mean, I, I'm not sure about the answer to that. I think there's a question there about to what extent you can get to a point where there is a sufficiently sufficiently large market like the EU or like maybe the United States, which is which is moved into a position where ecological restoration and protection is a fundamental priority. And that when they enter into trade, you know, and trade with China is massive, of course, that then they're in a position where they can say, well, actually, we want to have a discussion around, around these principles. Um, but perhaps it's going to be difficult to do that without having moved moved the needle here politically, I think, um, especially when it comes to, you know, the competition over, over Africa. And, and let's not forget, I mean, even with the Biden administration, for example, um, how are we going to avoid that risk of, of you know, going to neo-imperial competition over resources in Africa? So I think there's a lot to do there um, in, in terms of really ensuring that those, those, those looking at these principles holistically and how they apply but I think that case to be made that there is actually a real, um, there's a dividend here, which is there's two things there, which I think we need to be able to communicate to policymakers, which is one that this slide into economic chaos within the business as usual framework is now inevitable. It's not gonna go away and you're not gonna be able to fix it if you're just applying the same old tools that created this crisis. And secondly, therefore, that the principle of, of, of foundational ecological restoration behind all that you know behind our markets and behind our trade agreements and so forth and so forth this is the only way to protect prosperity going forward i think those two things we need to find ways to really communicate that to policymakers in a convincing way through science and through economic research perhaps um and and maybe that's the way to kind of to, to again we work on that and to get a sea change on that makes it much easier to then have those conversations at that top level. Okay, Sally Lawson. Thanks. Sally, are you with us? Uh, we can't hear you. <laughs> so two questions, if I'm allowed, very briefly. Um, why is deforestation going up during COVID lockdown? And is there any way you can see to encourage reduction of that? And the second one is, shouldn't we be trying to reduce the meat stroke beef um, consumption? And if so, any ideas about how to try and move forward with that? So on the first question, um, my understanding is that one of the reasons it's gone up is, is there's just been, it's certainly in, in most of the tropical regions, there's just been a kind of economic pressure in the sense that the a lot of producers were facing massive, massive uh, economic problems as a result of the massive, the, the sudden slump in demand, crash in demand really globally. Mm. And so in order to kind of keep things going, there was a ramping up of, of production um, that was going on. And I think also there was almost just the indirect effect of lockdowns, which meant that there was a lot less monitoring going on. Um, and e e you know, even like NGOs and stuff that are on the ground that were usually doing these things were not anymore on the ground. And so it kind of gave, you know, allowed certain areas to turn in kind of like a no man's land of just craziness. Um, so things went quite out of control for a bit. Um, I think uh, in terms of um, dealing with, I mean, absolutely, I think, we, you know, all the evidence suggests um, that there has to be massive reductions in meat consumption. Um, and it doesn't matter where you sit on that spectrum and some some people would say we know we know i want to um completely eliminate meat consumption and some people say that we you know we can still have some meat consumption and i think that's i think both of those are reasonable positions um and you know you can, again have a good debate 
about what what works best but absolutely i think that you know, right now it's totally unsustainable it's out of control the meat consumption is mm. is totally out of control so we need to look at reducing consumption and again this is a big question is, is uh, with the eu is is why are we talking about one commodity and not talking about if, we, if, we, if the eu was really serious about deforestation which is why i, I really question what's going on here why wasn't beef production at the top I mean, there's been data on this for, for, for more than a decade. Um, and instead, it's just, you know, this is fine. Let's just ramp it up, continue going and in fact, have trade deals with, with, with Brazil and all the rest of it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so we need to have a real kind of uh, public awareness campaign, I think, around the toxic impact of, of meat consumption. And of course, that's linked to soy production as well, um, because of the especially because sort of soy's role in, in the animal feed and so on and so forth so in a way both of those are quite intertwined so we need to do something about that reducing consumption on the one hand in general i think is important but on the other, on the other hand to countries like brazil what we want to be able to say to them is, is look we, we don't want to stop uh, purchasing beef but we will stop purchasing beef if this is what you're going to be doing and this is these are the conditions that we we want to have in place and we want to use models that are working like uh, for example uh, in, uh, MSPO or similar type of regulatory approach that is enforceable within Brazil and we want to work with you in developing this work with you in enforcing this and, and then we're happy to have an agreement with you on how we can have uh, imports of beef but they have you know there has to be some kind of a new framework to do this and so far the EU has just hasn't been serious about this and I think you know, one of the reasons for that is the mismatch in the consumer awareness around, issue, you know, a commodity like beef as compared to a commodity like palm oil. There's kind of a mismatch. And I think that we need to just equalize that, make it a lot more balanced. And again, that's why I'm saying let's stop talking about one commodity or this commodity or that. Let's talk about all of them. And let's just have a consistent approach to, to sorting out our consumption habits and our production habits across the board. Thank you. Okay, th thank you. Um, Elizabeth Harrop, are you with us? Do you want to ask your question? Oh, hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, hi, hi. Naveen, thanks for your talk. Yeah, I just wondered about um, the role of the UN, because technically they're bringing every state in the world together, but they're quite disparate in terms of what they do. So, like, um, the United Nations Environment Programme produced a report against beef and advocating for plant-based diets you've got a special rapporteur on the environment doing really good work you've got the global compact for sustainable businesses which is weak so that, so they are developing a human rights in business treaty at the moment but then the counter forces to that are an obsession with gdp and economic growth and international development exactly your point about africa being exploited i do some work for the un in South Sudan, where 5% of agricultural land is currently um, farmed, and there are big moves to massively increase that, but none of that will benefit citizens because of corruption and inequality. <laughs> so I'm just interested in your view about how the UN could it be harnessed to kind of drive this agenda forward, bearing in mind those kind of factors. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I'm not an expert in the UN system. Um, I've done a little bit of work with the UN um, in the past, but unfortunately, I don't really don't really know what the best way in. It's something I've I've wondered as well because obviously the UN system there is a lot of a lot of levers there and a lot of a lot of potential reach. Um, but what are the best ways to do that? I'm not sure, um, especially because the UN has actually been quite a prominent voice. On deforestation, you know, they, they mean that they've got. Um, there's a lot of data on on deforestation which they produce. There's been a, um, the UN Environment Programme put out a report earlier this year about um, the deforestation as a driver of pandemics. Um, so there's some work going on, which is quite important and significant. Um, but perhaps the question is: is to what extent is there a sufficient kind of holistic thinking going on? Uh, in at the UN level in those agencies and, and perhaps there's not enough kind of joined up thinking um, and something needs to be done to address that but actually you know 
I'm sorry I can't be more helpful, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm probably as baffled as you. Yeah, maybe it's unrealistic to expect joined up thinking when it is so diverse and also when it's, it's an unequitable organisation in, in, in and of itself because of how it's kind of structured. So maybe you just have to get entry points where you can and just make the most of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were real problems with the UN Sustainable Development Goals in the sense of the, uh, you know, the kind of very big prominence given to, to economic growth. Um, but particularly, I mean, there was a there were many many um, environment groups and community groups that were involved in the consultation around the SDGs and spoke of how they had been essentially kind of excluded. Um, their ideas were were ignored. Uh, the concerns that they had raised were ignored. Um, and you know, a lot of big businesses who are involved in the UN system, you know, had you know a lot of clout in how the SDGs were ultimately defined. And set out. Um, so that's kind of the structure that we're dealing with, unfortunately. Yeah, it's true. There was a university in Australia that did an assessment of the SDGs, and I think it was something like 70% of the indicators undermine biodiversity, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay. thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, Adriana, you made some comments. Did you want to uh, just present them and discuss them a little bit, or? We can't hear you at the moment. That's it. There we are. Oh, um, hello. Um, yeah, no, thank you, uh, Nafis. Um, really brilliant work. Um, yeah. And um, also, I love the space too, because with space, then people feel that they too can contribute so it's it's um delicate work i think uh yeah I, I just made some comments in the chat and um yeah you can have a look but thank you very much okay thanks adriana um it was partly along the lines of how we actually socially market this stuff uh which i i think was were that we really oh, I see okay so yeah, um, yeah no um so if you, thank you um yeah no uh, one of the ways which i've noted um is the way that we um global crisis and global crisis is like um obviously it's intended to fill people with panic but what it lacks is um for those people who like to have, um, I know, an intelligent way forward, and that's a part of their persona. And let's face it, that is a part of a lot of people's persona um, and something which is attractive. Um, and the, the, the idea of an identity, private identity, winning from understanding a way forward, um, I think is a way that we're not marketing all of this at the moment. Um, so, for example, um, instead of you, um, which I know I'm only quoting you when you said out of control, in a way it undermines your own um, a thesis, um, because as far as you're concerned in your work, it's not in fact out of control. Um, it is a part of our process which we can move and adjust in particular ways to create positive outcomes. Um, and with that tone, not only is it hugely masterful, but it will attract people who also want to seem as if um, this is the, we're moving, you know, this is, I know, a way to move intelligently forward. And um, um, although it's subtle marketing, um, I think that, for example, calling it a wake up call is much more gentle on people than filling our children with the idea of doom and forests kind of burning to the ground and an uncertain future. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, I think um, I think there's a fine fine line to walk here, which is on the one hand, it's actually quite critical, I think, to be very clear about what the prospects of our civilization really are. On a business usual trajectory and we have to confront that um, because if we don't confront that then there isn't 
a real awareness or intelligence about what's what is in front of us and simultaneously we need to confront what is possible when we do confront that um, and that allows us to be able to say that not only is change absolutely necessary in order to, for us to avoid that but to then to be able to say that when we envisage that there is another way and that we have to have another way if we want to avoid that sort of calamity the other ways actually are hugely exciting and offer all sorts of possibilities that were unimaginable within the current way of seeing and doing things and i think this is important it's important i think we do need a bit of both and um we need to strike that fine balance between um being able to educate ourselves about the reality of of of, of what we face but not to allow ourselves to lapse into that sense of apathy um and kind of like oh hopelessness um, but really to use that as a, as a, as a, as a boost to say, actually, the, the, this, is the, this is the way we have to now take action um, and, and change the way that we're doing things. And the, the opportunities are actually fantastic. I mean, um, there's a number of studies that have come out really looking at, at, at the opportunities that we have. And there was one um, paper by a think tank called Rethink X, um, which I don't always agree with everything that they say. Um, but one of their recent studies talks about um, what happens when you when you have solar, wind, and battery technology combined, and you go you aim for one hundred percent. And what's the interesting um, distinction that they've made is that if you actually aim to introduce more renewable energies than you might consider necessary, and go far beyond the targets that most governments are looking at, you can actually get to a point where the the, the, the costs of the production are so are, are much, much lower and the surplus energy that you get is, is so much higher than what you might envisage previously that can have massive changes to your society and opens up all sorts of opportunities for how you can then change your society and change your production process and so on and so forth. It's a really interesting visionary way of seeing things. And again, I don't think it's a perfect vision. I think there's all sorts of... Um, potential loopholes in there uh, and we need to be pragmatic and realistic as well at the same time but but it's it's really important to recognize that this is a this is an opportunity to shift to 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 all sorts of possibilities for a new civilization which we we can't imagine within the current framework and that's why it's so important to just to break outside of that that way of thinking if i can just say one last thing when you described that then um, uh, you just sounded pragmatic. Um, also, it sounded like a business model. Um, it sounded like news anyone would be happy to hear. So I, um, um, there certainly is a way of, of you um, describing, I mean, you're, this is what you're doing all the time. Um, uh, without, um, it, without, for example, it being like, um, someone just standing in front of you and telling you the worst news you can possibly imagine and expecting you then to do something positive in, in response. That's all. But thank you. Oh, th thanks, Adriana. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we always need to be thinking about the human response. Okay, so uh, next we have Oscar and then um, an anonymous person who's called PSX. And uh, then we have Peter. Well, Oscar, are you with us? Yeah, I'm with you. Um, I have an idea of a triangle to, to view this uh, where we have we the people in one corner and we have the uh, governments that are elected somehow and the elite. So that's the three corners of the triangle. And we know that the society is structured by investments and that the investments are done um, mostly by the elite, more or less uh, visible. So how, <laughs> what chances have the people to elect uh, a government when the elite has uh, 
a growing power to buy the politicians, buy the governments, and at the same time, um, influence how the people perceives what is happening through propaganda and uh, how they control the social media and all this. I mean, this is a power play that is really difficult to understand how it will play out. What's your view on this, Nafiz? Well, I don't think it's particularly um, you know, new to kind of recognize that there is you know, massive kind of, you know, there are elites that have all sorts of overwhelming power and all the rest of it. The question is, what are you gonna do about it? Yeah. What are we gonna do? Are we gonna do this diagnosis and sit here and cry? Or are we gonna get up off our asses and just do something about it? Because we have to, yeah. we have no choice. We have to stand up, we have to act. We have to do everything in our power before each of us hit our grave to change that scenario. The other thing to do is also to realize that the elites are not homogenous. You know, th there's, there's, there's a whole, these are people like you and me. Let's get in the room, let's speak with them, let's talk to them. Yeah, I'm sure they suffer from cognitive bias like all of us. They have ide ideologies, they have interests. They have a way of seeing the world, but let's get in the room. Because the only way we make change is when we are in the room speaking and dialoguing and talking and pushing and pressuring and shouting, as well as outside. We need both. You need Extinction Rebellion on the streets and you need people in the room who are talking and convincing and cajoling. So and excuse me, did you accept the description I made? No, I don't accept it actually. I think it's highly simplistic. Okay. It's it's not a very uh, it's not a very useful way of seeing things. Um, just saying that there are elite, there is an elite. You mentioned one elite. Yes. And then you said you refer to the elite as they with a capital T, and then you said that they control social media and do propaganda and buy our politicians. These are all sweeping generalizations that have a grain of truth to them, but when you put them in that way we are left with a sense of powerlessness and an inability to respond, which is unhelpful. What so, we need is a very specific diagnosis of those power structures, and then we can have a strategy for engagement and change. When you have a specific approach, then you can see where the leaves of power are, where the concentrations of power are, where the interlocks between these networks of power and where the opportunities for engagement are, and then you can actually act. So it's really important to be specific and clear when we're diagnosing these, these are very real, I mean, there are very real power structural inequalities. Absolutely, there is elite power, there is propaganda. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years, reporting on this kind of stuff. You know, covert operations, black ops, all the rest of it, you name it. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're powerless. It means that we just have to do everything we can to engage and shine a light. So this was a simplification with this triangle. Do you have a, uh, a similar simple model that that can help us when we discuss this uh, I mean, so is this, I mean I think one of the things we need to do is we need to be developing um, models and strategies for engagement in this in, in a way in the so what what you see happening at the moment is groups like Cambridge Analytica hired by cliques around the likes of Steve Bannon who are doing population mapping and stuff like that against us. But what we're not doing is we're not doing that against the them that you've identified, for example, which is what we actually should be doing is mapping out who are these networks, these power structures, but not with a view to say, oh, they're so evil and that's at the end of it, it's so terrible, which maybe there is, a, maybe it is evil and terrible, but we need to map that out so that we can actually see what are the mechanisms of engagement and change there with political parties, with the institutions that support them, with the hedge funds that are there, with all of that. Let's identify those people. And it's not just a case of doing a naming and shaming, with there is a very good value for investigative journalism and that kind of thing and calling people out, but actually being able to say, well, I wanna to speak to these people. I wanna to speak to the hedge fund people. I wanna to speak to these donors. I want to speak to them so I can communicate with them so they can see the things that I'm seeing. Because that dialogue isn't happening. And I think what we'd probably see is that if those avenues of dialogue are opened up, 
we may actually be surprised because there are many, many people, um, not, not far, certainly not enough people, but there are many people that I know in some of those sectors who are going through a real wake up phase. They're certainly in a minority, a tiny minority, I'd say. Yeah. But, you know, there are people, I mean, for example, just the people who are, I mentioned Rethink X. I mean, one of the guys behind Rethink X is a big hedge fund guy, James Arbib, um, who clearly, you know, in the last decade or so has gone through a big kind of awakening based on things that he's read and seen and he's educated himself. And now he's using his investor credentials to offer a different approach. And I think this is what we want to do is we want to find a method of scaling that sort of process. How do we wake people up in these powerful constituencies and scale that impact? And, you know, I think it starts with discussions here where then each of us is able to say, well, what, actually, what's, what's my leverage point? Who can I reach as, as, as the person in my network that I can then change? You might not be able to access someone in a hedge fund or blah, 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 blah right now. That's fine. But there may be other people that you can access um, in your community, you know, in the political space you, you're, you're engaging in, in, in your workplace, um, your family networks and their networks and the people that they work with. There are all sorts of spaces that we can map out around ourselves and we can say, where are the, where are the leaves of action? Where are, the, where are the arenas of engagement that I can actually see myself moving into and, and, and you know, speaking to and doing something and engaging in dialogue? But that does involve a certain upgrading of ourselves as well. We need to stand with a degree of integrity and a degree of, um, you know, we, we're not here to kind of, you know, we're not preaching to people, we're not forcing something on people. We're trying to enroll people into a way of seeing things. And, that, and our ability to do that really depends, you know, and I've been through this before when I've been in a, in, in a space where I've wanted to, you know, pummel the ideas onto people and being very frustrated when people don't understand what I'm saying. So there's a, there's a lot of work to do before you are able to get people to actually listen to you and engage with you. And it means being able to sit with people's perspectives. So there, you know, there's ways of us learning these approaches, you know, enrolling ourselves and then being able to enroll other people. But I think so, that's something that in all our different institutions, especially those involved in kind of change strategy and, and, and that kind of thing, you know, we can really, we can all work towards bringing these ideas into our organization, looking at these strategies and, and, you know, really thinking how can we make these maybe a bit more formal even, you know, as institutions can, do we have, should, should we have programs of engagement and change engagement as institutions, you know, Schumach Institute, other NGOs that might be present here or this is something I think we should all be thinking about. It, from, I, I really see it as something which is, is, is a mode of behavior and engagement which can be scaled in different contexts. And of course, there are going to be, play, there are going to be contexts where there is more funding and more human resources and other sorts of resources which can be put into that kind of thing. But I think all of us can do it at different scales. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, you have to stop now. Yeah, sorry, because there are other people waiting. Thank, thanks very much. Um, Peter Schlitter. Well, very brief. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoy your presentation, Nafis. Um, but I ha have some points that I think um, is a little bit um, concerning, and that, that is, of course, you need a synoptic view over thing, a global, a global eye, so to speak. But on the other hand, um, I can say from a Swedish perspective that, um, I mean, there is a bit of a danger, I think, to generalize about deforestation or forestry on a global scale. I mean, you can see it on a micro level in Sweden, where a lot of people debating environmental impact on, of Swedish forestry doesn't really differentiate between small scale uh, so to speak, family-based forestry and industrial scale forestry with absentee landowners or industrial owners. And they operate on totally different logics and also to some extent with different environmental impacts. Um, and, and that I think makes it a bit important actually to discuss where you are discussing, discussing deforest, uh, deforestation and how you define it. I mean, if you go to Scandinavia or Sweden and Finland, 
we actually have more forests now than we've had for several centuries, measured as a volume. Uh, and, in, and if there's a, a, a problem if, from a biodiversity point of view with Scandinavian forests, and I would say for most European forests, and this ties into the debate about beef, is that, that to some extent most forests are undergrazed from a historic and cultural point of view. And the biggest biodiversity losses we have in Sweden are actually tied to uh, change land use that is being extensified uh, because there is no grazing in forest and in general uh, free range grazing and uh, attendant haymaking is disappearing. And the same is true for most of Europe. Yeah, these are good points. I mean, I think it's important to be very specific, as you said, about um, how deforestation is playing out in different regions. I mean, it, one of the other things that's also interesting is that the global rate of deforestation has, over the last decade or so overall, has declined, which is really good news. So even with the grim warnings of a, of a kind of you know, when you're taking a big macro picture, looking at the rate of deforestation and projecting it forward, it looks very, very grim. Um, but still, it shows that there is a, the things that are being done to address deforestation to some extent are working. But I think there's also some serious issues here, which is, of course, I mean, you mentioned what's going on in Sweden. I'm not familiar with what's going on in Sweden at all. Um, but I am familiar with some of the studies on what's going on in Europe in general. Um, and, you know, the uh, deforestation is increasing in certain parts of Europe and it is having an impact on biodiversity. Um, that doesn't mean it's the only thing that's having an impact on biodiversity, but to the extent that I mentioned that 49% increase figure, that's been shown to be having a fairly significant impact and it's related to policies, you know, over biomass and, and things like that. Um, so I think there are some there are some important issues there, but of course, again, you're right, we shouldn't there isn't, there's, you can't have a one size fits all approach when you're looking at um, the ways in which forests are used in different contexts for different reasons. You know, so Europe has a certain use for its forests and a certain way of doing things, which would be very different to Malaysia and the way they do it. And that's why to some extent you need a certain degree of local, there has to be a local, you know, these sort of standards that we're looking at there has to be a certain respect for the local needs and local issues that are going on. Otherwise, it's not really going to work. No, no, I fully just... agree. I, I will uh, fully agree. Yeah, uh, so I think, but, but at the, and again, at the, so then there's the question of how do you, you know, manage that across the board, across these different commodities, um, and, you know, and have a kind of a global recognition. And I think that's, that's the balance that needs to be struck, which is the challenge, which is ensuring that we have a sort of global pact of, of some kind that says that we want to make sure we protect our forests um, and we don't want to increasingly encroach in our forests um, without reason. Um, but, it, but we have to do it in ways which are locally sensitive and make sense locally. That's the, the challenge we need, to, we, need, we need to meet. And yeah, I, I, I don't, and I've given some ideas to how we can get there, but I think, um, you know, it's going to be a tough one. Uh, what I would like to add is, is, of course, that one thing that tends to get overlooked uh, is, of course, the sustainability of the soils. I mean, you could argue that Sweden has more forestry than ever, but uh, by the combination of uh, acid rain and uh, the way forestry is carried out, a lot of our forest soils are not really nutritionally sustainable. And I think that is a, a, a matter that is to some extent overlooked, at least in the current debate on the need for a more bio-based economy. There is actually a potential risk here uh, that, that uh, if we strive for a, a larger share of, of bio-resources for energy or, or other uses, uh, there is a risk that we may, may visually, so to speak, have the forest in place, but that we are actually depleting the soils in a rather drastic sense. And, and that tends to get overlooked, and I think, in, in most certification schemes. That's a really important point. Um, and I think uh, it comes down to this importance of this regenerative approach to agriculture, where we're, we're kind of 
we're having the you know we're enriching the soil rather than depleting the soil which is the current industrial mm. kind of paradigm shifting away from that um it's something i actually spoke to when i was in malaysia i spoke to people in industry about this and i said to them that if it's in your interest if you want to maintain your industry to ensure that it's actually truly sustainable and regenerative um and I said to them that if you if you don't do this and you look at what the local impacts of climate change as well are going to be, and yet your industry is going to collapse, it's just not going to work. Um, so even from a self-interested point of view, there has to be this shift. I think the other solution is is that yeah, I mean the other issue is that there is a, there's a problem overall with the the hope that biofuels um, is is you know the answer, and I think there's a bit of a delusion about this going on in Europe. And again, I don't want to switch to the complete opposite side and say, let's just stop by, forget biofuels altogether. I think there's a case to be made that there is a case for a degree of sustainable biofuels as a, as a, as a bridge fuel. But again, you know, how much and how far do we go? And does it make sense in the context of an endless growth system? It doesn't. You know, then you're looking at, as you said, you're looking at a scenario where endless consumption on our side is potentially depleting and degrading ecosystems outside um all the while while we you know using you know maybe using certification or using our artificial standards of forests to say everything's fine and that's obviously a, the worst of all world scenario um what we need to do is is here in the west in the north we have to take that responsibility and move into a state where we're saying let's find ways to reduce our consumption um reduce our, our need our, our desire for biofuels for example and just and then tamper that down dramatically because i think overall what we're seeing that the big message we're seeing is that the big driver of all of this is over is a, is a, is a machine system which is just exponentially growing you know and the, the reason all of this you know we're having these carbon emissions and this accelerating rate of deforestation ultimately comes down to the fact that we're just we don't want to stop that consumption machine and fundamentally that's what what has to stop and that's what we have to look at so there's also that balance between um, you know, looking at regulating things and, and mitigating and doing all of that stuff, but also fundamentally changing the, the, the course of the system from its core, I think. Okay, I might just allow myself a comment here, which is that we've got zillions of really, really bright people pouring mental energy into trying to work out how we can get back to growth. I mean, what might our offer be to some of these, some of these brain boxes who are currently working for, how can we redirect, you know, uh, because what you're talking about is, is a need for an enormous amount of joined up and complex thinking and research. And of course, we've got quite a, quite a reasonable research capacity, but hey, it needs to be a lot bigger, doesn't it? So that's my question. It's something about reorienting the whole research effort towards uh, towards what you're talking about and actually really getting economists on side with all of this it's a tough one i mean there's we've got i mean there's now like quite a wonderful vibrant emerging sphere you know, in you know ecological economics and you know degrowth and steady state economics and there's all sorts of heterodox economics which is unfortunately still not really taken seriously by most mainstream econ economists but you know I think it's a it's an uphill struggle that we're starting to you know we're starting to make a dent in the conversation I think but I, um, what does need to be done is to increase that dialogue I think between between more conventional economists and those who are working in, in these spheres but there's lots of credible work that is being done um, you know, there, uh, Julian Steinberger just uh, she was involved in a, um, a paper that was recently published um, talking about how you can transition to, you know, reduce growth by something like 40 percent and still grow your population up to 10 million and still provide um, decent living standards with, with good energy, clean energy supply and, you know, food, water. Um, and they even went into this quite granular detail about the capability for washing your clothes and you know transport networks and, and and communications infrastructure really really fascinating stuff and that was based on 
very, very, you know, in a, I mean, it was unconventional assumptions, but it was conventional economic modeling. Um, and it works, you know, they showed it can work. So what we need to do is really amplify. And certainly with this current government, there's this kind of fetish for mathematical modeling. So maybe mathematical modeling is, is something that will be taken more seriously. And maybe we need to do a little bit more focus on using mathematical models to communicate how these things could work and have them be taken seriously, just as an idea. That's not my forte, but um, there'll definitely be some other people who might be interested in doing that. Thanks. We keep on asking you really tough questions, Naviz, but there's a few more people uh, who are on the list. Uh, Jonathan. Hi. Hi. Am I audible? Yes. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Nafiz. Um, I have a clarificatory question, which is to refer you back to your, um, which I might have misunderstood, but your comments about energy being part of the planetary boundaries framework. And my immediate thought, which is largely based on my having read just that paper and maybe one or two others, I think there was a very recent update in Nature, um, is that isn't it in there in the form of climate change? In a sense, how much energy there is in the atmosphere. Um, so that's, that's one point. And another question is, it strikes me that trade is probably part of the system writ large as much as people trying to accumulate billions of dollars or um, consumerism, um, deforestation. Um, and I wonder how much actually, given the degree of transformation required, I wonder whether we shouldn't just aren't we really talking about the end destination being um, what Keynes once described as, which I think was probably prompted by Schumacher, everything being homespun. So shouldn't trade be gradually whittled away rather than being recommended as part of a solution complex? When we finish those two, I've got a funny little story. Thank you. Great questions. Um, so the first one about climate change. No, climate change doesn't incorporate the idea of uh, net en the energy system as such. Yeah, it does indirectly in the sense that climate change is a consequence of um, burning a particular type of energy, uh, which obviously has the impact of carbon emissions and all the rest of it. But I'm talking specifically about um, the dynamics within the energy system. Um, and that's interrelations with the economy, which has impacts which are separate and cannot be modeled. Um, if you're just modeling the climate, you're not going to model the dynamics of the energy system. So these need to be, it's, it's like, a, it's just, a, it's another, you know, it's not a system which you can model and you should model. And you can, if you model it, it will give you insights into how it's interrelating with, with the other kind of systems. So I think it's an important thing to take into account. Again, I'm not fussed about maybe it should it, should it be considered a planetary boundary or not? Probably, maybe not. I don't know, but I don't think you can understand planetary boundaries fully without understanding the energy system. Of course, climate change is a part of it, but without incorporating that dynamic between the extent to which we are um, consuming energy, the resources that we are using to extract energy as well and then what we get out of it and mapping that together, you, it's, you, you miss a lot of very important data that tells you about where we're going because the way in which that, that, that trajectory goes. So when you, for example, are a point where if, you know, for example, using that, we go back to that graph that I was referring to where we saw the net energy curve kind of peaking and going down, that, that, that inflection point tells you a lot about what's happening with your economy, why it's happening, and how that feeds into your consumption, whether it's sustainable, because most of the consumption levels, I believe, really now are being sustained through the acceleration of debt. You know, there's a massive divergence between the real economy and that. And that creates further dynamics for exponential growth in itself. It's a kind of a it's a kind of cannibalized, self-cannibalizing system. When you when you can really grasp that, that gives you a sense of what's happening.
the speed at which you're potentially encroaching on your planetary boundaries and what's really driving it. Yeah, but you know, I'm not again, you know, I agree it might not be the thing that you should just add as a planetary boundary. You, 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 in that sense, you might be totally correct. Um, but I don't think, again, we can understand planetary boundaries fully without having that broader perspective. Um, to move to your second point about, uh, I've forgotten your second point now, just give me a quick reminder. Just to unmute yourself. Yeah. Does trade belong, thanks for that. Nice. Does trade Great. belong in homespun? In, yes, yes. In, yeah. in the end game. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't particularly have a view really about whether trade, I don't, I don't think there's any specific desirability in just ending trade. I, don't, I think that's very, that's slightly unrealistic. Um, it's just trade is a tool. Um, I think that what we are moving to a point where we're realizing that smaller is better. We're moving to a point that, that, that avoid, stopping, slowing our growth and making our growth sustainable or even eliminating growth, these are now on the table as things we should be moving towards. And I also see that um, doing as much as we can locally is imperative. But does that mean that that we should not have trade internationally? I don't. If if, you could, if, if there is a, pro, a form of trade which it's a fun question. Sorry, that is that it's your question? question. Sorry, that's your question. No, it's fun to think about the answer. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't think that it's I don't think that's particularly I think it really depends. I mean, if it's possible to do it, that would be great. I don't think it is. Um, I mean, it, it, I mean, it might be we might mm -hmm. and then we might be forced into it. Who knows? There's all sorts of scenarios that we can look at. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just think... going to stop you there because we've got four more questions yeah. and 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask people to be really fairly brief in their questions and also Navi's. Um, if you can, it's difficult, I know, but you want to, you always want to answer questions really fully, which is great. But so we've got Claire and then Anna, and then we have Max and Mark, and then we're going to have to finish, folks, and give Navi's a break. <laughs> so if we could start off with Claire. Uh, Claire McIlvenna. I, I wasn't really posing a question as much as just making a point about um, most of the things Nafiz has said, and I agree with them entirely. And I'm thrilled to hear him mention Extinction Rebellion at the moment. <laughs> so thanks for that. Okay, that, that's great. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank I'm you. really glad you could come along. Thank you. And uh, Anna. Oh, hello there. Um, so I just wanted to uh, yeah, ask a question, but I will try to make it um, brief. It's already been spoken about um, a certain amount. So, um, but back to what you were saying about um, how we talked about how one of the big issues is there's a lot of resistance uh, politically and uh, big business and things like that. Um, and uh, people are saying, oh, you've already spoken about the fact that despite this, we do need to try to at least engage. Um, and I guess I just wanted to ask a little bit more about that um, and how much room uh, for an approach like that you think there is. And so, for example, um, this idea that of really making it, you talked about we need to make it, uh, politicians realize that it really is in their interest to do this um, because we need a, a sound ecology in order to have any kind of, um, economics at all um, and uh, and also more than just e not just making it seem like it's in their interest but also take account of really actually take account of the pressures they face from uh, business interests and things like that and try to work with them on that rather than potentially them sometimes feeling like you know it's just like uh, not attacked but this idea these these you know where you've got uh, people, you know, left and right, and um, um, and sometimes just pushing for things. Without, do you, do you think there is scope for really working with um, some politicians, or do you think that's just a naive approach and they're not interested? Um, and um, and then the second question was was also about um, um, about 
also big if there is big uh pressure you know big interest in oil companies and all that kind of thing do you think that in order to try and tackle some of the pressures that they put on governments that stop changes happening do you think also there needs to be real thinking about how some of the people in these industries once if we know stop supporting these industries can they still be how there's going to be a kind of transition for them to go into other industries and not completely just lose everything. Um, this is all very, I'm not an expert in all this, so some of this probably sounds a bit uh, naive and not thought through, but it's just uh, this idea of can there be some kind of constructive yeah. engagement with some of these industries and, and politicians, um, or is that naive? No, so I think these are good questions. Um, I'll try and be quick. Um, so. I think basically on the my answers to both will really be the same, which it's not naive to to say that again politicians are human beings. We have to stop just looking at kind of just we have to look at people as what they are. Yes, there are human beings with cognitive biases, with ideologies, with interests, and all the rest of it. And then we go in and we engage, and when and at the same time knowing that there are those issues, then we may be outside and we may criticize and put pressure and you need both. And it's the only way we're gonna do this if we have both and we have both and we do them strategically. If we do it in a haphazard way, which is like now that, you know, that's when it doesn't really work. Um, and there are gonna be politicians who don't care and don't listen and are a lost cause, but there are gonna be politicians who do listen that will wake up. And also politicians are always changing. Um, so, you know, the other solution is to become a politician and do things differently. Um, but also, you know, don't be, you know, the system might be broken, but does it mean it's unfixable? No, um, we can fix things. Humans are always fixing things. We're breaking and fixing all the time. Um, so let's try to fix things and let's have a vision about fixing things. Let's even, no matter how broken things are, I do, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in, in, in the idea of, of massive radical structural change. You know, I don't think our democratic system on its uh, in its current form is fit for purpose i think the system which works could be quite different in some ways i don't know how to get there exactly but i think we were, what we're doing is a grand experiment we're, we're iterating um and that means that yes same with the oil industry um you know even B, bp and exxon mobil are putting out report i mean exxon not so much but bp is putting out reports talking about peak demand and you know, we, there's no point investing in oil anymore blah, blah 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 so even within the industry there is this change taking place it's been really slow to come but we can galvanize that change using those pressure points okay thank you now we have max and then we have mark yeah hi uh thanks nafiz and schumacher institute for putting this on um i just wanted to ask because uh, you spoke about the declining energy return on investment and you spoke about declining GDP growth, growing debt um, and the increasing volatility of oil prices and um, you know finance and, and GDP and people's profitability, able ability to make profits. Um, and at the same time there's this deforestation happening that is interlinked with that whole financial and energy based system. Um, and I'm just wondering, don't these, uh, so that with the declining energy return on investment and the, you know, increasing instability of what's going on with finance and um, investment, like the ability to make profits off of things, doesn't that lead to a tipping point where it's no longer profitable to invest in deforestation anymore to, to invest in cutting things down to, to make commodities to send across the world i'm just thinking of all the chainsaws and logging trucks that have to carry the trees around and the fertilizer you have to put into the ground to grow the whatever that you're you know that you're replacing the forest for doesn't that just become not worth it yeah, yeah. Does that, doesn't that make it easier to actually go towards the framework that you've laid out? Well, I think the problem is, is that if we were living in the real, the real world economy only, that would be the case. 
But the problem is the economy doesn't actually, the way we classify things in the economy, it doesn't account for real costs and so, you know, what we call externalities. So the real costs of these things are not factored into the economic system. Um, they're actually put aside. Those costs aren't recognized. So the, the recognition of a profit is also, you know, profits also accumulated by co corporations to these very specific processes. So we're not at a point where that can be felt. And in fact, what's happening right now is, you know, within this current paradigm, the, the pressures are making companies do stupid things like let's accelerate deforestation more or, you know, or let's violate, you know, these regulations or let's cut, cut costs here and use bad labor and all sorts, you know, whatever crazy things that, that people are doing. So that's the other one problem. Of course, the, the context for that also is the massive QE the quantitative easing that's come in and essentially this debt money that's been used to kind of keep that show going, which has masked and stabilized the system and the crisis and allowed it to keep on that you know, juggernaut and allowed to continue to grow. So that's the crucial context, I think, for why it's why it's gone on like this. But I think you're, I do think you're right in the sense that there does come a point when this isn't going to really, you know, the show can't go on. Um, and that's partly what the pandemic has done is it's kind of acted as a bit of an amplifier and it's accelerated some of those things. I think there's a question mark over exactly when those processes, if we wait for the time when those processes become recognized as unprofitable, it will be too late. Um, the system will have all got to a point where it's just, um, you know, it will have flipped and it will just be too late, I think, at that point. We can't wait to that point. We need to wake wake up much earlier because it's already so we're already getting to the point where it's too late so <laughs> okay thanks so uh mark last question okay last question um <laughs> and i've got so many ben i'm trying to distill this into one pertinent one i'd i'd make an observation first and that is that whether we like it or not this country at any rate is um, going to have a conservative government for at least another four years, if not another nine. That's reality. And the Conservative Party is absolutely crystal clear that it will do whatever it takes to stay in power. That's the, it is the natural party of government in this country. You can't avoid that conclusion. The question is then, how do we engage with them in such a way that they will develop policies because they actually do believe they're doing the best that's possible. They are the only party that's actually legislated any climate change legislation in the last however many years they've been in power. No other party has been in power. How do, we, how do we work with them to encourage them to do more than they're doing now um, and demonstrate to them that by doing that, they'll stay in power. They'll do whatever they, whatever's needed. So, so the question and the challenge is, not to not to um, speak of the Conservative Party as a pariah, though it may be, but perhaps to speak in terms of how we can encourage the Conservative Party to do more than it's doing already, given that we have a Prime Minister whose father is a major climate change advocate, major climate change writer and speaker, and population issues and uh, and biosphere and ecosystem issues, he's very, very clear about it. So we have the ear of his father and therefore we have the ear of him, if we can speak it right. So how do we do that? Fantastic uh, questions again. Um, I think um, these are really good points. It's very important for us to think strategically about these issues in this way. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, be fatalistic about the prospects for changing the government. I think we should also be realistic in the sense that you're absolutely right, we should be prepared for a long time conservative government. Um, and I think it really depends on your own context and, and what you're comfortable with doing. But strategically, we need to do both. We need to continue to engage with other parties that have a possible chance of getting into power at some point. But we do, that doesn't mean that we do not engage with the Conservative Party or the Conservative government. And that, I think that's a huge mistake. And I must say, as, as a, coming from a, a Muslim background, as a British Muslim, my direct experience of this 
I've seen that the disengagement of the British Muslim community, completely understandable um, from the Conservative Party. There's been an almost complete disengagement and it's been catastrophic for the community, I think. And that's just to give you my sense of perspective of what can happen, because when you're completely out of the room, mm. then those other forces can come in. And that's what's happened is, um, you know, you've had all sorts of uh, slightly nutty uh, Trumpist forces coming in and there's not been anyone to counteract them and to temper it um, and I'm you know I'm not particularly a Tory um, so you need to we we have to have a strategy of engagement um, as well as disruption um, and that involves again I think it's the case of on the one on the one hand there has to be a calling out and a pressuring from the outside uh, an embarrassing and a, a thing like that but there also has to be a way of, of leveraging people within the party who have a, you have a chance of gaining their sympathy of getting their ear and getting them to move and I think we we should give some recognition despite all of the awfulness of the party and all the rest of it it is quite unprecedented that it's been the British Conservative Party that was in the first government to basically announce this net zero targets and all the rest of it mm -hmm. and to take the position that it has at least you know even having that public stance on climate change is a, quite a sea change in terms of you know getting such a right-wing government to take that position which now is a platform for engagement and to say well you've said this and you've committed to those net zero targets what are you actually doing mm -hmm. um you know of course the, the the danger is is that there is for them this this is also a strategic game of co-opting and something that the conservative party are very good at very adept at, at co-opting and and uh, utilizing the discourses of the opposition, bringing it in, subverting it, and neutralizing the opposition and weakening it. So we have to be very careful that that's not happening. How to do it? I mean, I, I would say that we need to think carefully about how we ramp up that engagement. And that if that if that means you know joining the party, if that means engaging with the party, having those conversations, reaching out, pressuring that should all be on the table. It's, and it's what every movement that has succeeded in change has, has done. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that this is a very important point and we shouldn't just say, let's stay out. My general view overall is that we have to have, you know, again, I come back to that point. There has to be a dual strategy. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a space and a room for super hard you know, investigative criticism and calling account and calling out but there also has to be a very, very strategic, carefully crafted engagement strategy, which you know, which is quite willing to go and speak to all sorts of people at these different levels in order to have those conversations and make sure those conversations are taking place. Unless you're having those conversations all the time, there's no possibility to communicate. There's no possibility of changing those mindsets. And I, I, think, we, I think you can. There's definitely a scope for changing people's minds when they have access to information and facts. And, it will take, may take maybe it's a difficult one to do but we have to do it good okay i think that's a brilliant point to end on thank you so much naviz brilliant uh, talk and really really good uh, answers to questions going on there a uh, lot more to say but uh, that will have to be for another day now folks so uh, thanks ever so much for everyone coming along yeah and uh, thanks again naviz and do have a look at the paper Okay, cheerio then everybody and uh, look out for our next cafe system change, which is also going to be very exciting. You'll, you'll hear about it soon. Okay, bye now. Thanks very bye. much, bye. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Bye everybody, thanks Nafiz. Brilliant. Uh, thanks Nafiz, that's really yeah. very good. Thanks, nice. James. <laughs> okay, bye bye now. Thank you. Thank you.